Cheers are one of the most, oh, got it, okay. Um, spine fractures are one of the most common um, causes of, of disfigurement and um, disabilities. The, the patients get this, this kyphosis, it can impact your pulmonary function, your, um, you get GERD, um, and it, it's, it's unsightly. And um, a lot of this could be prevented if we uh, paid more attention to it. Okay, so this would be um, a piece of um, human vertebra, you know, wash off the marrow, to show the difference between the bone and the young, normal, and the osteoporotic patient. And a couple of things are happening. There's less bone here, but also there's a lot, the, the young normals have a connected structure here, which is much stronger than the osteoporotic patients who just have a lot of, of holes and uh, loose ends that aren't connected with each other. And when we look at it under the microscope, um, we can see that here, the normal patient, you can see that there's a lot of connections, a, a few bones we're looking at and on, but the osteoporotic has these big holes in the middle and, and um, you know, just some unconnected bone that doesn't have any structural support. Um, I'm also showing this because we're gonna have a whole series of slides now that are based on uh, looking at and measuring what's going on with the bone formation and, and resorption. And um, we, um, when we do biopsies, we stain it so that the mineralized bone is stained um, green. And this stain doesn't show it except one little bit here. The unmineralized osteoid is stained red. So here's a high up picture um, and it's showing a trabeculae of bone. These, these small cells are the osteocytes. These are actually all connected to each other, almost like the brain. They all have long processes. They are sensing what's happening to your bone if you're putting a load on it and they're directing the rest of the cells. The osteoblasts are lining these, you can't really see them very well. You have to zoom in even more, but they're lining the osteoid, which is the unmineralized matrix of the bone. And then the mineralized bone is um, all this blue stuff. And here, here's the marrow. This gives you an approximate um, indication of most of your bone surface is neutral, um, but about a normal person, about 8% of the surface is engaged in forming new bones. So we call this a forming surface. And so you can see here, this is gonna, this is going to fill up, okay? So now we're going, this is not to scale. It's just to show kind of what the cells do and, and what we call um, a bone metabolic unit. So this would be the surface of the bone with the osteocytes and, um, Here's a stromal cell. This is the marrow. This is a capillary. And these cells are circulating pre-osteoclasts. These guys are related to macrophages. Um, the stem cell has um, two, two paths. One goes to macrophage and the other goes to pre-osteoclast. These cells are stromal cells. So the... Um, that's, that's just kind of the quiescent surface. And then what's going to happen? Is that there's a crack. So in a minute, there, you get a crack. So now the osteocytes are getting killed. As they die, they're sending signals into the marrow, OK? And that causes this reaction. So the cells that are lining the bone form a canopy. Now we have a very special space in here that's connected to the circulation. Um, we have a lot of growth factors in this place. And these growth factors cause the stromal cells to divide and make pre-osteoblasts. 
And the pre-osteoblasts make something called rank ligand, which attracts the pre-osteoclasts to make a osteoclast. And in addition, the osteocytes make rank ligands. So this is the rank ligand and this is the rank. This, this process is um, blocked by one of our drugs called denosumab, which blocks that. Okay. Then the um, osteoclast resorbs the bone to get rid of that damaged area. And as it's resorbing the bone, it's releasing even more growth factors that were laid down by the previous generation of um, bone formation. So this space is filled with um, factors. Some of the important ones are TGF beta and IGF. All of these growth factors are coming to signal these stromal cells that are gonna eventually cause the cells to fill up the hole. Okay, the osteoclast undergoes apoptosis. And meanwhile, the osteoblast makes something called osteoprotegia and that blocks rank ligand to put a break to the process. Now, the apoptosis is actually controlled by the estrogen level. So when you go through menopause, the um, osteoclast takes longer to go through apoptosis because the, the estrogen um, encourages osteoclast apoptosis. So if you go through menopause, the, um, this cavity will go deeper Okay, and you're gonna dissolve more bone. That's the primary reason why you lose bone with menopause and why women get more osteoporosis than men. Okay, so now, we, now we're gonna fill in. So you make a team of osteoblasts and they form together and then they very slowly secrete a matrix and then it mineralizes, the green is mineral and some of them stay behind to become new osteocytes and some of them stay behind to become lining cells and the rest undergo apoptosis and now they all reconnect and gradually gradually you're going to refill the bone and now we're back where we started um, this whole process the the resorption actually takes place in about two to three weeks the uh, forming part takes place in about six to maybe a little bit longer months. So there's a real difference in how, how much you, you, you dissolve it quickly, you fill it in very slowly. And the whole, the whole process turns around about once every five years. So that after about five years, you're, you've actually remodeled your whole skeleton, okay? So now if we zoom in on the osteoblast, it's secreting collagen, which is a propeptide, and it, it gets cleaved into two ends. So every time the osteoblast secretes a molecule of bone collagen, you're going to generate these pro propeptides. And the reason I'm saying this is this, oops, okay. Well, the P1NP is a marker of how much you're forming bone. And it hasn't really come into total use yet in medicine, but I think as people start trying to tailor our medical, our treatment to our underlying physiology, and you wanna know what the physiology is, then measuring the markers is going to tell you that. And um, we actually do it in our clinic a lot more than most people. Now, meanwhile, these um, collagen molecules have all, all line up like this then they form covalent bonds and each end is bonded to an adjacent molecule. So, so that's the C-terminal end and the N-terminal end. And eventually the osteoclast will come and dissolve this. Okay, so the osteoclast secretes um, hydrogen ion into this and that dissolves the calcium away. And then it secretes something called cathepsin, which will break the collagen into fragments and it breaks them right here so that these covalently bonded fragments are gonna circulate. And we can measure this. So um, the more bone resorption you have, the higher these, we call them cross-linking molecules. This one's called C-terminal telopeptide of collagen. This is N-terminal. They're measuring the same thing and 
right now the assay for this one has it's um, unavailable, but we have the assay for this one. You can measure it in the blood. The higher it is, the more resorption you have. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna show you now, we're gonna put this all together. And this would be stepping back a little bit. Um, this is as much bone as we will see. If you just look at one trabecule of bone and you're gonna see the crack, and then you'll see the osteoclasts coming in and the osteoblasts. Oops. Okay. And we call this a BMU. It, it spreads along the surface of the bone and it's getting rid of damaged bone. It's filling it in with brand new bone. And then it takes a while. It can take about more than three years for the mineral to come in and make it even denser and denser. So um, I'm showing the different shades of green here are referring to bone. Like this is a really particularly old bone that hasn't been remodeled yet. So it's very dense. And this brand new bone um, is not very dense at all. And I. I often tell my patients, think about your earlobe here, or you're not your, the um, cartilage, and that's cartilage, that's um, unmineralized, but then think of your skull, it's, it's mineralized bone. So if we all just had bone without mineral, we would have osteomalacia and it wouldn't be very strong. Um, and this is just a, another photomicrograph. Um, to show what they actually look like under the microscope. These are the osteoclasts, these large cells with a lot of nuclei. And you can see they're dissolving right along the edge of the bone here. And they've, they've actually, you have to imagine now this process is going in in this direction from left to right. The osteoclasts are moving this way. And then following them are the, the uh, new osteoblasts. They're, they're very tall in the beginning and they're starting to form and as, as it gets older, the osteoblasts are um, forming a row here. They're forming the brand new bone and, you can, and the mineral is starting to come in and this whole process is moving along. Okay, now we step back even one more step. And this would be about a millimeter of bone. This is what it more or less looks like if we're looking at a microscope slide. And um, this is what happens hopefully in all of you that we're, we're continually just refreshing our bone. So I'm, I think most people just think of it as this static, you know, um, static structure, like the I say a leg of a table, but it's not at all. It's, I mean, compared to the heart, of course, it's not that dynamic, but it, it definitely has a certain amount of physiology that most people don't really think about. But this, this is what's, you know, we're speeding it up, but you can see you're just really refreshing your bone all the time. And in a normal person, you fill up as much as you dissolve. And, and so you're in a steady state. But what happens as you get older is you don't fill up as much as you dissolve. So with menopause, um, remember that the osteoclasts, deep digger, I mean, um, we'll go deeper because they don't have estrogen. And so on these trabecular structures, you can dissolve from both sides and you'll get a perforation in there. And you can't, you, you're gonna try to fill up the holes, but you can't quite fill them all up. And so what's happening is that you're dissolving a lot. You're not filling it all the way back up and you are going to be losing bone. So that's what it looks like. So, so the bone turnover right around menopause is actually pretty high, which is not actually good for you. And so you can see you're ending up, these, these are micro calluses from a crack, here's a perforation and you lose bone really rapidly the year before and the year after your last men menstrual period. Um, and this was a study using micro MRI. So 
um, these are on, in humans who, women who um, were within a year of a normal natural menopause. <clears throat> and they, they can take a, um, a sample, this was from the tibia, and they followed them for um, two years after menopause. And if you really magnify it, you can see right here that there's a hole developing. And here, again, so those perforations, we can actually pick up on x-rays if you have high enough resolution. And, and that's what's causing the loss of structure and the osteoporosis that eventually happens. And with these changes, we can measure it. So remember, NTX measures your bone resorption. Um, this is a study that where they just um, measured women for a, a long time, and then they took all the data and lined it up according to the last menstrual period. And so you can see that the NTX starts going up two years before the last period, and then for two years after, and then you, you stabilize, but you're stabilizing at a higher level. And um, this, uh, these are the thin women. The thin women are, are actually having the highest bone loss. Okay, so what happens if we give estrogen? And what happens, and this also is with uh, raloxifene, which is a serum. And so I'm gonna have six months of um, the, the turnover, the um, plane, and then we'll add the medicine and you'll see what actually is happening to the formation and the resorption. And remember the formation is this, this red part that's, that's forming new bone. And the resorption, of course, is when the holes are coming. Okay. So now we add the drug. And what's actually happened is you've gone from a high resorption to a more normal resorption, but you're still having some what we call turnover, you're forming and resorbing bone. Um, and I actually want to point out that um, these were all based, these little movies are actually based on um, looking at <laughs> hundreds of fields of um, uh, under the microscope and measuring all the surfaces. Okay, so, so this is actually um, graphical data of, of the study we did with raloxifene. Um, and it's, it's subtle because this, this is actually two scale. Um, but what you don't see is any of those perforations that we would have seen. If you remember the last study, the, the last one, there were holes here and here. So you're preventing any perforations. You're not gaining a great deal of bone, you're gaining a little bit, but you're making the bone stronger. And both estrogen and raloxifene, that's their way, their mechanism of action is to slow down how fast you're dissolving the bone, and but you're not slowing it down altogether and you're still able to form bone, okay? And then um, again, what happens to the markers? Well, the, the um, bone-specific alkphos is an alternate way of looking at formation. The formation is actually going down but not all the way. And the reason it's going down is you're not dissolving as much, so you don't really need to try to form as much. And the main thing here, we're seeing the, the CT lipeptide going, going down in estrogen, not quite so strong with raloxifene. So you're slowing down the formation and the resorption with the net effect that you're gaining more bone um, and stabilizing the bone so that you don't, it's really, a, in the end, it's stabilizing it. And that, um, I don't have a picture here. So the estrogen will, you can continue taking it for life. And by the time you get to be in your 80s, you're going to have um, about a third as many, a third to a half as many hip fractures in women who've taken estrogen long-term because of the fact that it's stabilized your bone that whole time. So now what happens when we use bisphosphonates? And so this is gonna be a similar thing. So six months 
turn over and then the medicines are gonna come and they, they're little triangles and you're gonna see them come in wherever you're dissolving the bone. So they'll, they'll stick here, here and here. And as you start trying to dissolve more bone, it, it will stick and prevent it. So you're blocking the resorption. Um, so let's watch it. So you're stopping the resorption, but since there's no resorption, there's no place to form anymore. So you really have very little formation, just, just a tiny bit. Uh, the surface that's forming bone goes from about an average of 8% to an average of um, 1%. And the bone is now just kind of sitting there. And so, so we've gone from something that's really pretty dynamic. Remember that first one, the normal bone is really dynamic bone. The bisphosphonate bone is really very quiescent. And in the very beginning, you feel a few holes up, but then from then on, from about six months on, it sits there and it allows mineral to come in. And so that's why I, called, I colored it a little darker here. I exaggerated that a little bit, but we can measure it. We can actually do backscattered electron micro microscope um, measurements to see that there is more mineral in the bone. And what does the mineral in the bone do? makes the bone density go up. So you didn't make more bone. And, and I think that's one of the, if, if there's nothing else that you remember from today, you're not making more bone. You're putting mineral into the bone you have. Okay. And here's the markers. So the CTX and the NTX go way, way down pretty soon after you start. The P1NP is, is the best one that's here in um, I guess I didn't color code it. So the P1P, it goes down, but it doesn't go down right away. It takes about three months before that one starts to go down. Because during this very, very early phase, you're, you're continuing the, to form in the holes that you had originally had before you started taking the drug. So that little phase doesn't last very long. And then after this, and now from, from here on, as long as you're on the drug, those are gonna stay low and nothing's gonna happen. Okay, so the next drug is teriparatide, and that's the one which is a, a parathyroid hormone analog, and parathyroid hormone increases the osteoclast, and as a reaction, you're going to increase the osteoblast, but it also really improves the osteoblast bone formation. So you're increasing both the resorption and the formation. And if you do it right, you're increasing the formation more than the resorption. So you end up with more bone than you started out. Okay, now this actually goes pretty fast. These are actually all too, at least time-wise and space-wise, they're to scale. And, and uh, I stopped here because that was when the study stopped. So we're looking at, the, this is again, real, real data um, before and after, but what we're seeing is that you have a, a lot of formation. You've dissolved a cavity in here, you've dissolved a cavity in here, but you filled it all in. You've actually created a new trabecule here from an old one. And um, the bone that you've made is not very dense yet. Now, if we kept on going, you know, if we stop and you, you wait a while, then all this bone is going to get more dim, more mineralized. And I'm, I'm, it went fast, so I'm going to show it one more time. Okay, so you see it, it really starts working almost immediately. And here's what happens with the markers. So the, the P1NP goes up like right away and then it peaks. And for reasons that aren't completely clear yet, it does, it's not sustained and you, you lose it again. And so 
most of the action with this drug happens with the first year and a half. Um, and the entilopeptide, which is the measure of resorption, also goes up and then starts coming down again. So we don't use this drug very long, partly because it really is not really effective for very long. Um, by the time you get down here, you're no longer getting that anabolic effect. You're no longer really making more bone. And so we tend to stop using it. The only exception is with steroid patients, it seems to, to last a little bit longer. And so we sometimes will use it for up to three years in the people who, who need glucocorticoids. Dr. Ott, we had a question in the chat. Oh, yeah. I think it's relating to, Ruth, correct me if I'm misrepresenting your question. It was, why did the dark bone turn light early on? I think that was referring to the graph or the graphical yeah. teropeptide. Yeah, so, so if you look, you dissolve away the dark bone and you're forming, the new bone is light. So what you're dissolving is the dark one and you're forming the light one. So the light bone, all the light bone is, um, is new, okay? Does that mean you have, you know, like you're, uh, you've demineralized the old bone? And therefore, it's more fragile, or what's what's going on there? Well, you haven't demineralized it. You've dis you've dissolved it away, so it's gone. And then you're filling it in with brand new bone, and the brand new bone takes a long time for the mineral to deposit in it. So after a while, then it will start getting darker again. I just didn't carry it out long enough for that to happen, but it's a good question. Okay. I guess to Ruth's question, in that early period of teriparatide, would you have like an increased risk of fractures because the resorption happens first and then it takes time for the rebuilding? Um, we haven't actually seen that. So um, I don't think so. Okay. Thanks. Um, okay. Now here's denosumab. So with denosumab, you're, it's like bisphosphonates. You're stopping the osteoclast, but whereas bisphosphonates inhibit them about 80 to 90%, denosumab inhibits it by about 99%. So you just are not forming any osteoclasts. And if you have no bone, if you have no osteoclasts, you have no bone resorption and you have no osteoblasts either. So. So give it us a shot. So here's the first shot. The second shot. Third shot. And now we skip a dose. And you get this remarkably fast resorption. And the, the um, you're, you're gonna form um, perforations right away. So if we wouldn't have skipped the dose, if I went, I don't know if I can stop it. If I just, you know, after this, after this second dose, it's really just gonna look like that forever. As long as you stay on the drug, nothing's happening. It's just sitting there. But as soon as you stop, you immediately start resorbing on a lot of different surfaces. And that's causing you to lose the structure of your bone very quickly after the last shot. And oops, I didn't mean to do that. Here's what happens to the markers. So the CTX goes down, you're not, well, almost 100% and it stays down. And the P1MP also goes down. And when, we, when you look at uh, biopsies, actually the way we measure the formation is we give tetracycline to see where you're forming new bone. With, um, with denosumab, about 80% of the biopsies didn't have any tetracycline labeling. So they're, 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 you're not forming 
and he knew bone at all with this drug. And the, we don't know the consequences of that after a long time, but we do know what happens with bisphosphonates after a long time. And the final one is the newest one, that's romozasumab. And um, <laughs> we, we could spend two or three hours just on how it works, but this, this is how it works physiologically. It's, it's um, blocking an inhibitor of formation. And so what happens when you give it is that you're going to increase the bone formation. So it's primarily working on the osteoblast cells to form more bone and, and, and you generate more osteoblasts. So you increase their proliferation, you increase the formation. Now the osteoblast, and you remember way back, the osteoblasts make that, that molecule called osteoprotegerin that blocks osteoclasts. So, so you, at the same time as you're forming more bone, you're inhibiting the osteoclast, so you're not resorbing it. So your forming it is increased and your resorption is decreased. So now you have two different ways of actually having more bone. And it also works very fast. So that, here we are starting and now we give the drug and you, you start about a quarter of your bone now, all of a sudden is forming new bone. And eventually though that wears off and then you do start dissolving again. So we don't, we don't completely understand why you get resistant to it, but we probably make other inhibitors. And so then you, then, then you start to revert back. So we, the drug only works for a year, okay? But you get a lot of bone and the bone is new bone. Oops, oh, let me show it one more time. And there's a question in the chat, which you might be yeah. getting to. How much does bone structure, i.e. an ordered bone matrix, contribute to bone strength compared to mineralization? Mostly curious which one is more important to prevent hip fractures. Well, um, well, I, I actually haven't seen that looked at directly, but I would say the structure is more important than the mineralization, but they both play a role. Um, the, if you are unmineralized, that, that's osteomalacia, the bone is, um, doesn't hold up the strength as well and it's painful, and, but you get different kind of, you get stress fractures um, and you don't just break it as much. The more, and I'll show you this a little later, the more mineralized you get, the way you fracture is different, okay? So the mineralization, kind of changes the character of the fracture, but I think the structure is still gonna be the most important thing. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so um, here's Romo. So the, the P1NP goes way up right away, but then you get a resistance and it starts coming down and by a year, it's pretty much where it started from. Interestingly, the, the resorption stays suppressed a little bit, even after a year. But what we tend to do is after a year, then we're gonna give a drug to, to block, to hold it in place, to prevent any further resorption. So you um, don't lose any of the bone that you gained. Okay, so that's just a kind of run through of the long-term effects. And then I was gonna show what happens when we discontinue them. And I don't have any I hope I'm on time. I don't have any kind of clock anywhere around here, um, but uh, we're we have about thirty five more minutes. Yeah, okay, yeah. that's what I thought. I, I don't know my my screen. It's not on the top. I guess it's Zoom took away my clock. Um, okay, the, the, it's kind of important what happens in the long term with these drugs because osteoporosis, you know, it, it's a chronic disease. Um, we're, we're looking at, you know, a lot of women are starting to get diagnosed in their 60s. We're looking at 30 to 40 years of disease. And we're using drugs that have been studied for, you know, three, two, three years. Um, because 
there really actually has not been as much research in bone in bone disease, relatively speaking, compared to um, other diseases. Uh, um, most of the studies didn't even start until the you know 1980s, mid 1980s, 1990s. So we're way behind. Um, anyway, estrogen. Um, I put this slide in because I think there's been a lot of bias against estrogen. I see it all the time. I see it in recommendations, um, even in the American College of Physician recommendations uh, not to use estrogen that are based on, um, well, some bias and also some of the older forms of estrogen and progesterone we use were actually harmful. But um, this one, one of the, um, I'm gonna call it myths, or I don't know where why it's so pervasive is that somehow alendronate is stronger, better, better for your bone than, than estrogen. And there's absolutely no data to show that alendronate is better for your bone than estrogen, okay? And so this is the best study because the women were directly um, randomized into three groups. So there were, um, these women were between 40 and 60. There were 1600 of them. They were either given a placebo, alendronate or estrogen and two different kinds of progesterones. And this is show, shows what happened to their bone density. Um, the placebo went down like we expect. Uh, the alendronate went up and the estrogen was significantly better. Uh, and I guarantee that about half a percent of doctors, if that, know that this happens, okay? So if you have a woman going through menopause and she is has a low bone density, you're not gonna wanna give her a lendronate. You're gonna wanna give her estrogen if you can. What about long-term use? So before the Women's Health Initiative, it was a lot more common um, to put women on estrogen. And so this was the study of osteoporotic fractures um, had almost 10,000 women um, recruited in four places across the country. And uh, this study has given us a lot of the epidemiology about osteoporosis that we use today. And um, they did look at estrogen and I forget the percentage. It was somewhere around 20% or so, 25% of the women were using estrogen. Now they all had to be 65 or older at the um, enrollment. And then they followed them for um, 11 years. And this is uh, the graph of the fracture rates. So um, at the beginning of the study, the baseline duration of estrogen was 24 years. And then of course, at the end of the study, it was 35 years. And this is the fracture rates during the study. And, and during that entire study, the estrogen users were significantly better than the um, non-users. So it keeps working for life. And the bone never gets brittle. Um, you're, still gonna you're still gonna lose some bone. It's not like we've stopped all the bone loss. What it, what it does is it reduces the bone loss to the rates that we'll see in men who, who maintain their testosterone. So long-term is okay. What about stopping estrogen? Well. If you stop, you lose your benefit, but that's about all. Um, this was the Women's Health Initiative. What happened after the study was over? This graph was the ones who had a uterus, and so they were given estrogen along with medroxyprogesterone. And during the first three years after the study, the fact this the fracture rate was lower in the ones on estrogen, but about three by about three or four years they were the same. So from then on, the fracture rates were the same, whether you were taking a placebo or whether you were, um, whether you had been taking a placebo, whether you had been taking the estrogen. And in this, this is the women who did not have a uterus. And so they were only given estrogen. So it's estrogen and placebo, same dose of estrogen. And you can see five years after the study was over, there was still a bit of a benefit in terms of a lower fracture rate. So um, you don't, um, if you stop estrogen, you're not going to um, have an increase in a fracture's 
compared to people who hadn't taken it. What about long-term bisphosphonates? Well, what happens with bisphosphonates is that the strength goes up a little bit in the beginning because you filled in some of the holes and you're not losing bone. But after about this, this would be about seven years, it starts to go down. This was a study of um, biopsies and it was just observational and actually kind of a small study, but um, they'd been on bisphosphonates for up to 17 years. And the, the strength peaked at seven years, but the cracks, they got micro cracks that just accumulated. So the longer you're on the drug, the more cracks you're accumulating and you're not able to resorb them away because you've inhibited the osteoclasts. So the cracks don't get repaired. So this is going to make the bone weaker. And it's just what they look like. So you can stain and see them, um, microscopic cracks. But these little tiny microscopic cracks, if they start accumulating, they're going to ruin this structural integrity of the bone. And that is oh, and it's just another slide of the cracks coming up. So, so you're going to um, have, have problems with, with the bone getting weaker. Now, that, what about bone density? Well, this is a fossil. And, and I sometimes ask people, well, what happens if you take the bone, you know, you bury it for a million years? Well, is that, is that femur any bigger or is there any more bone in it than there was 70 million years ago? And the answer is no. What happened to it? Is the mineral crept in? And that process um, is actually happening with uh, bisphosphonates and it would with denosumab if we kept people on it, that um, you're gonna replace your water molecules with calcium and phosphate molecules. And so it's more mineralized. And a little bit of that is okay. It'll make your bone a little, you know, if you're really unmineralized, it'll make it a little stronger. But after that, it just is making it more brittle. And here's an example of a tree. So this is a tree that was a living tree and it got knocked over by a windstorm. Um, and see how it cracks. Here's a tree that was in the, uh, the fossil fossilized tree in Petrified Forest National Park. And I was struck by the way this log re resembled the fractures that we see in our bisphosphonate patients. Okay. So it's, it's um, a mechanical property of material that when you're brittle, you, you, your, your um, fractures are gonna be a different form. This is what we would call a typical fracture of the femur. It's kind of shattered, it spiral. This would be the atypical ones. They really have this, this very clean line, on the, especially on the transverse side. So, so it's the hypermineralization and the lack of repairing all the cracks that makes the bone um, with long-term use get more brittle. And this is what it, here's just an example of one of our patients. And you can see that the incidence still is un very uncommon. Uh, we were looking at um, Southern California Kaiser um, and reviewed all the x-rays of anybody older than 45 who, who had an x-ray in their femur. Um, and there were 13 out of however many million people in Kaiser who, who were not on bisphosphonates at all. And then we could see that as they were on bisphosphonate, that's down here, you can't even measure it. But as they've been on bisphosphonates, the incidence goes up until um, after eight years. It's, it's gone up um, about one in a thousand patients. And this has been reported now uh, quite a few times. So with long-term use, it's not all that common, but the longer you're on it, the more common it gets. And one in a thousand is really kind of an unacceptable rate. But if you stop taking the medication at this point, you're not gonna see that. And what about ordinary hip fractures? This is an area of real uncertainty. 
and um, I would say considerable controversy. Do you also have more just ordinary hip fractures with this drug? And there's some hints that that might be true from the Women's Health Initiative, where they compared the, the fracture rate with a duration. They just looked at the women who were on it. If they'd been on it for two years, this was their baseline. And then compared to that three to five years, it, it was the same rate, but as you were on it 10 to 13 years, you were seeing significantly more fractures um, and they had adjusted for age which is pretty critical. So there are some ongoing NIH trials trying to look at you know, big data and um, observational studies, but it's really difficult to study because you, you're giving the women the drug in the first place because they have osteoporosis. So of, of course, some of them are gonna have fractures. So how can we tell if the fracture is just because you started too late or you know, just was gonna happen anyway, or it was caused by the drug? especially when the drug was so effective in the first couple of years. And that answer is gonna be really important, but we don't really know. What we do know is this, this was um, the first study of alendronate lasted for four years. And the women were actually given the medicine again for one more year. So, they looked at a thousand women who had been taking alendronate for five years and randomized them into placebo or continuing alendronate. So we call that the FLEX study. So this was the, this was the randomized part of the trial. And they all, they're only looking now at the women who, who were on the arm that got the alendronate. And this is the marker of bone resorption. That's the MTX. Okay, so during the first part of the study, of course, this is where it was before they were treated. They all go down and they stay down. And at this point, they get randomized. And the white ones, I um, can't remember which was which, because it doesn't matter. Anyway, this, one of them was uh, randomized into placebo and the other into lendronate. And you could see that it didn't matter. That the bone resorption, um, remained low for five years after they stopped taking it. So what happened, you, you stop taking it, but it's still in the bone. So it sticks to the crystal in the bone. So you really don't stop. It, and eventually it's gonna wear off, but it wears off very slowly. We figure the half-life is 10 years. What about the fracture rates? That's what really matters. And this is the fracture rate. Um, this is during that last five years. So at, at time zero, everybody's been on it for five years. And they, they either stay on it, again, doesn't really matter the colors. So the ones, the alendronate group is green and the placebo group, no, the placebo group is green and the alendronate groups are red and black. So it didn't help, you didn't need it. You had the same number of fractures if you stayed on it as if you stopped it, which is one of the main reasons I say, well, for Pete's sake, stop it. Your risk of getting atypical fractures is going up. Your risk of getting ordinary fractures is not helped at all. So there's no reason to stay on that drug. But then people, I have seen a lot of people who are experts and should know, know better, but um, they also, if you look very carefully, are getting a lot of funding from the drug companies. Um, and they've said, but the ones who are at high risk need to stay on it. And I still see that in some guidelines. Well, you can, you can take your low risk patients off, but your high risk patients need to stay on it. But if you look at this, in this study at the ones who had the high risk, it's the next slide. The only difference here is we have fewer patients, but these are the ones who only had really low bone density. And again, it, it, it didn't help the ones on alendronate had just as many fractures as that's the black line as the ones um, on placebo. So whether you have high or low risk, um, oh, in our clinic, we don't, we don't keep anybody on it longer than five years. Okay, teriparatide. If you discontinue teriparatide, then you lose what gains you've made. And so you need to, if you're going to use it, you need to, to re, um, 
stop it and then replace it with a anti-resorptive drug. And either a bisphosphonate or a raloxifene will work for that. Um, this was one study they gave the teriparatide for a year, and then they stopped and the spine came down, the hip eventually came down. But if they switched over to raloxifene, the spine stabilized and, and the hip kept going up. And this group stayed on the teriparatide um, for two years, but eventually it wouldn't have worked. It would have, they would have lost the, um, the bone formation. So you you keep them on it for a, a year, you can, up to two years, and then you switch over to a bisphosphonate or you lose what you gained. Now, what happens after long-term denosumab if you stop? So this was the first study of denosumab where they gave the study lasted for three years. And the blue line was the placebo group. And the red line was the denosumab group. And you can see that the spine density went way up with the denosumab and it kind of went down with placebo. And at three years, this placebo group was also given denosumab. So during, during this time, they're, they're all on it. And you can see the bone density keeps going up, actually. And here's the hip. And then they stopped it and they got this pretty rapid loss within, and most of this loss was actually within six months. And at the spine, they came down, and at the hip, they went down lower than the baseline. Okay, so here's the baseline, and they, they really dramatically lose bone, and that's really fast. So during that phase of very, very rapid bone loss, here, you're, um, oh, this is just the graph. So they're losing 8% in about six months. Um, and, and what explains that rapid loss? Well, it looks like the, the medicine has created a new kind of cell that's never been described before. We have a name for them now, they're called osteomorphs. So the osteoclasts normally undergo apoptosis. But if you inhibit rank ligand, instead, they fissure, so they break up into little multinucleated cells that, that'll circulate and they're long lived. But if you expose these cells to rank ligand, they immediately fuse. And they have all of the expression of an osteoclast and they're, they're ready to go. And so you can imagine that they're all circulating around as soon as they can, they're gonna start dissolving bone. And this is what happens. So if you stop the drug after being on it for three years or more, you, get, you can get a series of um, compression fractures in the spine. And this is one example, what it looks like. Here's another one. She just skipped a dose and she got one, two, three, four, five, six fractures. Um, and this, this was some of the features of patients. 35 patients had 172 spontaneous vertebral compression fractures. That's their age. It's, this is about, the minimum was seven and the maximum 20 following the last injection, but the median was 11. So since you're due every six months and it's 11 months after that, that means that they're, they're five months late. And but you can get some who are only three or four months late for their appointment. And you guys are in the clinic, you know how often people reschedule their appointment for a few months later. Um, vertebroplasties was a disaster. 12 women had vertebroplasties, 58 new fractures in the following days. Okay, so you can add that up. Um, just showing that even, well, th this one, they, they gave a dose in May and she got all these fractures. They tried to rescue with giving another dose, but it was too late and um, she just got all these fractures. And if you try to uh, give zeledronate, I don't think I, 
I don't have. Um, I did. There's one other slide because it was too new to put in. They they just looked at um, the incidence of these fractures from that first original randomized trial. The ones who'd been on, and they looked at the people who quit the trial. The ones who quit within three months. I mean, sorry, within three years. Um, their their fracture rates were not really any different than the placebos. The ones who quit after three years, 7% had two or more fractures. And, and of those, 3.5% had four or more fractures within the next six months. So you're looking at 7% chance of at least two fractures if, if you've been on it for three years and then quit. So what are we going to do? So they want to stop. Well, you can give zelendronate, and that attenuates the loss. But you're still losing. And you, and usually, zelendronate gives you a pretty nice increase in the bone density. But if you've been on denosumab, it, it uh, still you're going to lose an average of about five percent, and at the hip, again, about five percent. But right now, that's still what's recommended because it's better than not doing anything. And we don't know exactly how well, how well it prevents these uh, vertebral compression fractures because it hasn't been studied yet. So um, with CKD, also you can get serious hypocalcemia. People come into the ICU with uh, arrhythmias, tetany, seizures. They, they need to have IV calcium drips. There's no trials. and. Um, we're recommending not to use it at all if you have CKD. And um, I'm just, oh, this is just back to the theme of, of um, other drugs. Robozosumab, if you stop robozosumab, you also lose. You can restart it and, and gain it again, but we've got to figure out what to do about you use this drug and gain all this thing, but then if you stop, you go down. So currently what's recommended is that you give um, a bisphosphonate. So now if you give the Romo, you're gonna get this really huge improvement in bone density, and then it'll hold with, um, this was two years of alendronate. Uh, I might say this is, for people who have serious osteoporosis, this is currently the best program that we have for uh, treatment. Uh, we're, we're seeing on average about 15% increase in the bone density at the spine and about seven at the hip. We have a, in the trials, a um, similar, as you would expect, a reduction in the fractures, which I don't have, but the, the fracture rate compared to alendronate is half, half of the fractures that you would see if you treated them with alendronate. So that's, that's the take home message um, that it's critical to have a plan for starting and stopping. And you know, there's, there's a lot going on in the osteoporosis field to, to answer some of these questions and figure out how often we can use these newer drugs, uh, anabolic ones that'll actually help us reduce the fracture rate um, and uh, what to do about stopping some of these drugs that uh, can give you the disasters. We we actually I actually don't recommend using the denosumab at all. So I, if if we have any questions, I can stop sharing it. I think um, we have time for a few questions. If there's any more, Doctor, I actually had a question out on that issue because I just had a patient refer to me in my clinic who I discovered was on denosumab and then just stopped. Now it's been a year. <laughs> And our last injection last December, and I'm bringing her back into clinic. Um, it looks like, so if people have been started on that, should they just be on it indefinitely? It looked like the Lendronate didn't really bring back. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we'll see. That's currently what some people are recommending, that you can use it and just uh, stay on it. Now, the question is, since it's working to block resorption, and we look at what happens with the other drugs that block resorption after five years, we see this kind of steady increase in atypical fractures and perhaps in other fractures. The other complication that's very rare that, that 
starts to increase with long-term use is um, the jaw osteonecrosis. So what's happening is that the reports of the nosumab causing these effects are coming in trickles just the way they did with bisphosphonates a decade ago. There's a case report here of three or four. There's a case report here of five or six. Um, so far, there's one, one review that the incidence of osteonecrosis is significantly more with denosumab. So um, what, what may happen if we keep them on it indefinitely is that they're going to start getting some of these um, problems with the unusual brittle bone because you're going to be accumulating cracks. And you, you're absolutely not forming any new bone with this drug. Uh, so it's frozen. And um, I just, I mean, I would predict that, it, that you would see the same kind of um, brittle factors with, with the nose, I mean, with the bisphosphonates, you can just stop. Uh, you know, you don't have a rebound, you just stop and then the bone density gradually drifts down. And um, they, they don't have, you, you know, we've never seen four vertebral compression fractures after stopping alendronate. But like I say, you're gonna see that, you know, I've seen it, so fortunately not any of my patients, but um, other doctor's patients who come to my clinic and oh, we can't figure out why this patient's had so many fractures. So, um, I don't, so think, your, I, don't your... think staying, I don't think staying on it for 10, you know, for indefinitely, because indefinitely, and then you think about it, that's 30 years for some people. Um, using this drug, we haven't even gotten any good idea of what happens after 10 years to, to, to commit them to 30 years. And what happens when, who's going to call them up every single six months? and remind them to come in. Uh, what's gonna happen when they get moved to a nursing home and the nursing home forgets the order? Um, it so just doesn't seem very realistic to keep people on it forever. So when those patients are referred to you, which this patient probably will be, um, do you yeah. end up generally then just putting them on a bisphosphonate for like a course? What we do is we put them on, we give them a IV sledronate and then, now this has been looked at. Usually it gives lendronate. Um, one great study gave, gave it to women with osteopenia and it, it kept the markers down for five years, okay? And the bone density went up for five years and then it very, very slowly, just with aging, came back down to where it started from 10 years later. So, so basically um, that's what happens if you're, um, a naive patient. If you give it to somebody with denosumab, there's going to be, and I don't know the exact percentage, but there's going to be a bunch of them who, even though you gave zelegenate, within another couple of months, their bone resorption has popped up again. Okay. So you, that's where measuring the CTX really helps. So what's recommended is you give them a dose of zelegenate. And then you, you wait about three months and you check. And there's been some people who need two doses of zelegenate. So you, you have to just give it and then follow it. And as, as long as the CTX is staying in the acceptable range, then you just follow them and um, decide what to do. Okay. Now there's Thank a possibility. You. That's one thing. There's there's a lot I didn't have time to say. With when you looked at the new new drug, romazosumab, that gives these beautiful results. If you give the denos the the romo, if you give romo to somebody who's getting treated with a bisphosphonate, it doesn't work very well at all. And if you give it to somebody who's being treated with denosumab, you don't get any gain in, in your bone density. So there, you're you're your naive patients are getting, you know, 15, 20, I've got 25% improvement in bone density in a naive patient. In a patient whose other doctor started her on bisphosphonate, we're lucky to see one or 2%. And, and this, is the, this is the biggest problem in our clinic is the stupid insurance companies. They all want you to start with a, with a lendronate. 
because it's cheap. And I go, if I start with the linderonate, I have closed the door on the best drug that we have. And we argue and argue, we're, I'm, I'm, we're, we're getting better. I mean, um, it's, it's nowadays it's only taking one letter <laughs> instead of three letters and an outside thing and threatening a lawyer and stuff. So, but the converse of that is if you're on, if you're ready on denosumab and you're worried about stopping, it turns out the romososumab doesn't give you any improvement, but it looks like it might prevent the loss. So we, we've had three patients now who had atypical fractures or osteonecrosis of the jaw on their denosumab. So now they come to me and I'm going, well, I don't want to give somebody who's already had an atypical fracture a bisphosphonate because that would make that worse. But I don't want to keep them on denosumab because that's why they got this, you know, I mean, it was like you boxed yourself in. And so I said, I'm going to try romososumab and there, there was nothing except to these reports showing that it didn't, um, it didn't improve the bone density. So we gave it to them and and so it did stabilize them and they, they haven't had, either of them had any further problems yet. So, so this is um, brand new. I mean, this is only this year. And so we were, there's still a lot of questions about what are we gonna do now that we've got this denosumab? There are primary care doctors giving it right and left. Um, it's one of the most popular drugs right now in, in some states. And um, so I'm, I'm worried that we're going to start having this epidemic of multiple fractures. Here at the U, there, I, I think there most people are being pretty cautious about it. Thank you. Uh huh. Want to allow um, the residents? Anything? Any I, I had a question. Yeah, I have a question. Can you hear me? Okay. I can hear you. Okay. Oh, okay, good. Thank you. Um, I was so you mentioned that time period, like the year before and after the onset of menopause, where people have increased like the highest uh, bone loss during that time period. Do you have any like, special recommendations from like a primary care perspective, like for that time period, um, other than the normal like preventative osteoporotic lifestyle stuff? Or yeah. what do you have? Yeah. Well, actually, what what I think is. Um, it's that we really, I actually think we should change our recommendations pretty fundamentally about screening bone densities. Because right now we're recommending to screen bone density when you're 65. And it's too late to start estrogen. But if we screen when they were going through menopause and they were low, then that would be the window where estrogen can be really beneficial. So it's very benefit. It, it actually, if you start and you, you only use transdermal estrogen and you don't use Provera and you start when you're right at menopause, there's several studies showing that there's a lower mortality rate and that's mostly driven actually by cardiovascular events. But it, it also really helps the bone that way. And our bone density is really, I think it's 80% is determined by our heredity. So you're gonna know at 50, whether she's you know in the, in the top or the bottom half. And it's one more, I think, important piece of information that a woman ought to have at the time that you can do something about it. So what I do see is, is sometimes women who, who, who are in their 40s and get more fractures than you would expect. So somebody gets bone density and it's kind of low. And for those women, I say at the very, the very first sign of anything, a little bit of irregularity, um, let's pop in and give estrogen. So if you give it right as they're going through menopause and they have lost a little bit, they'll gain it back. You know, there's a window of opportunity. You'll gain back the, the bone that you lost very recently. So as soon as they, you know, feel some hot flashes, you can check an FSH if you want, or you can just start her on um, the transdermal uh, estrogen, okay? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? 
I think time is up. <laughs> okay, yeah, I think we're out of time. Um, but thank you so much, Dr. Ott, for that talk. Um, incredibly yeah. informative and um, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I'm just, what I really hope is people will start thinking about the underlying mechanisms of what's going on here. And not just what's going on with the bone density, but what's going on with the bone itself. And then uh, eventually, you know, and then trying to treat it accordingly. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. Really appreciate Bye. it. Bye-bye.